Hello everyone, and a warm welcome to the introductory module devoted to organic chemistry. You may not have noticed, but you are already a highly skilled organic chemist. As you watch this lecture, your eyes are using an organic compound called retinol to convert visible light into nerve impulses. As you typed in the name of this lecture, your muscles were undergoing chemical reactions on sugars to provide you with the energy you needed. As you understand what I am telling now, gaps between your brain cells are being bridged by simple organic molecules, neurotransmitter amines, so that nerve impulses can be passed around your brain. And you did all that without consciously thinking about it. You do not yet understand these processes in your mind as well as you can carry them out in your brain and body. You are not alone there. In this course, I am going to show you what enormous strides have been taken in the understanding of organic chemistry since the science came into being in the early years of the 19th century. Organic chemistry began as a tentative attempt to understand the chemistry of life. It has grown into the confident basis of worldwide activities that feed, clothe, and cure millions of people without their even being aware of the role of chemistry in their lives. Chemists cooperate with physicists and mathematicians to understand how molecules behave and with biologists to understand how interactions between molecules underlie all of life. The enlightenment brought by chemistry in the 20th century amounted to a revolution in our understanding of the molecular world. But in these first decades of the 21st century, the revolution is still far from complete. I am not to give you the measurements of the skeleton of a dead science, but to equip you to understand the conflicting demands of an adolescent one. Like all sciences, chemistry has a unique place in our pattern of understanding of the universe. It is the science of molecules. But organic chemistry is something more. It literally creates itself as it grows. Of course, we need to study the molecules of nature both because they are interesting in their own right and because their functions are important to our lives. Organic chemistry has always been able to illuminate the mechanisms of life by making new molecules that give information not available from the molecules actually present in living things. This creation of new molecules has provided us with new materials such as plastics for manufacturing, new dyes for coloring our clothes, new perfumes for personal use, and new drugs for treating diseases. Some people perceive these activities as unnatural and consider their products dangerous or unwholesome. However, these new molecules are synthesized by humans from other molecules naturally found on Earth, utilizing the inherent skills of our brains. Birds build nests, people build houses, which is unnatural. To the organic chemist, this is a meaningless distinction. There are toxic compounds and nutritious ones, stable compounds and reactive ones. But there is only one type of chemistry. It occurs both inside our brains and bodies, and in our flasks and reactors. Born from the ideas in our minds and the skills in our hands. I do not intend to position myself as a moral judge in any way. I believe it is essential to strive to understand the world around us to the best of our abilities and to use that understanding creatively. This is what I aim to share with you in this course. Organic chemistry started as the chemistry of life, when that was thought to be different from the chemistry in the laboratory. Then it became the chemistry of carbon compounds, especially those found in coal. But now it is both. It is the chemistry of the compounds formed by carbon and other elements such as are found in living things, in the products of living things, and wherever else carbon is found. The most abundant organic compounds are those present in living things and those formed over millions of years from dead things. In earlier times, the organic compounds known from nature were those in the essential oils that could be distilled from plants and the alkaloids that could be extracted from crushed plants with acid. Menthol is a famous example of a flavoring compound from the essential oil of spearmint and cisjasmone, an example of a perfume distilled from jasmine flowers. Natural products have long been used to cure diseases, and in the 16th century one became famous. Quinine was extracted from the bark of the South American cinchona tree and used to treat fevers, especially malaria. The Jesuits who did this work did not of course know what the structure of quinine was but now we do. More than that, the molecular structure of quinine has inspired the design of modern drug molecules which treat malaria much more effectively than quinine itself. The main reservoir of chemicals available to the 19th century chemist was coal. 
Distillation of coal to give gas for lighting and heating also gave a brown tar rich in aromatic compounds such as benzene, pyridine, phenol, aniline, and theophene. Phenol was used in the 19th century by Lister as an antiseptic in surgery, and aniline became the basis for the dye stuffs industry. It was this that really started the search for new organic compounds made by chemists rather than by nature. In 1856, while trying to make quinine from aniline, an 18-year-old British chemist, William Perkin, managed to produce a mauve residue, mauvein, which revolutionized the dyeing of cloth and gave birth to the synthetic dye stuffs industry. Perkin's attempt to synthesize quinine from aniline was a remarkable practical challenge, especially considering that, at that time, the structure of quinine was still unknown. A related dye stuff of this kind, still available, is Bismarck Brown. Much of the early work on dyes was done in Germany. In the 20th century, oil overtook coal as the main source of bulk organic compounds, so that simple hydrocarbons like methane, propane, and butane became available for fuel. At the same time, chemists began the search for new molecules from new sources such as fungi, corals, and bacteria, and two organic chemical industries developed in parallel, bulk and fine chemicals. Bulk chemicals like paints and plastics are usually based on simple molecules produced in multi tone quantities while fine chemicals such as drugs, perfumes, and flavoring materials are produced in smaller quantities but much more profitably. As of now, there are over 16 million organic compounds known. How many more might there be? Even counting only moderately sized molecules, containing fewer than about 30 carbon atoms, it has been estimated that something in the region of 10 raised to the power of 63 stable compounds are possible. There are not enough carbon atoms in the universe to make them all. Among the 16 million that have been made, there are all kinds of molecules with amazingly varied properties. Organic compounds may be crystalline solids, oils, waxes, plastics, elastics, mobile or volatile liquids, or gases. Familiar ones include sugar, a cheap natural compound isolated from plants as hard white crystals when pure, and petrol, a mixture of colorless, volatile, flammable hydrocarbons. Isooctane is a typical example and gives its name to the octane rating of petrol. The compounds need not lack color. Indeed, we can soon dream up a rainbow of organic compounds covering the whole spectrum, not to mention black and brown. In this table, I have avoided dye stuffs and have chosen compounds as varied in structure as possible. Color is not the only characteristic by which we recognize compounds. All too often it is their odor that lets us know they are around. There are some quite foul organic compounds too. The infamous stench of the skunk is a mixture of two thiols, sulfur compounds containing SH groups. But perhaps the worst smell ever recorded was the one that caused the evacuation of the German city of Freiburg in 1889. Attempts to synthesize thioacetone by cracking trithioacetone resulted in an offensive smell which spread rapidly over a great area of the town, causing fainting, vomiting, and a panic evacuation. The laboratory work was abandoned. There are two candidates for this dreadful smell, propane dithyl or 4, methyl 4, sulfonyl pin and 2, on. It is unlikely that anyone else will be brave enough to resolve the controversy surrounding the cracking of trithioacetone. But nasty smells have their uses. The natural gas piped into homes contains small amounts of deliberately added sulfur compounds such as tert-butyl-thiol. When I say small, I mean very small. Humans can detect one part in 50 million parts of natural gas due to added tert-butyl-thiol. Other compounds have delightful odors. To redeem the honor of sulfur compounds, I must cite the truffle, which pigs can smell through a meter of soil and whose taste and smell is so delightful that truffles cost more than their weight in gold. Damascenones are responsible for the smell of roses. If you smell one drop, you will be disappointed, as it smells rather like turpentine or camphor. But next morning, you and the clothes you are wearing will smell powerfully of roses. Many smells develop on dilution. Humans are not the only creatures with a sense of smell. We can find mates using all our senses, but insects cannot do this. They are small in a crowded world, and they find those of the opposite sex of their own species by smell. 
Most insects produce volatile compounds that can be picked up by a potential mate in incredibly weak concentrations. Only 1.5 milligrams of sericornin, the sex pheromone of the cigarette beetle, could be isolated from 65,000 female beetles, so there is not much in each beetle. Nevertheless, the slightest whiff of it causes the males to gather and attempt frenzy copulation. The sex pheromone of the beetle Papilia japonica, also given off by the females, has been made by chemists. In this case, as little as 5 micrograms was more effective than 4 virgin females in attracting the males. Do not suppose that the females always do all the work. Both male and female olive flies produce pheromones that attract the other sex. The remarkable thing is that one mirror image of the molecule attracts the males while the other attracts the females. Mirror image isomers of a molecule called frontalin are also emitted by male elephants. Female elephants can tell the age and appeal of a potential mate from the amount of each isomer he produces. What about taste? Consider the grapefruit. Its main flavor comes from another sulfur compound, and human beings can detect concentrations reaching parts per billion of this compound. Why evolution should have left us so extraordinarily sensitive to grapefruit, I leave you to imagine. For a nasty taste, I should mention bittering agents put into dangerous household substances like toilet cleaner to stop children drinking them by accident. Notice that this complex organic compound is actually a salt. It has positively charged nitrogen and negatively charged oxygen atoms, and this makes it soluble in water. Other organic compounds have strange effects on humans. Various drugs, such as alcohol and cocaine, are taken in various ways to make people temporarily happy. They have their dangers. Too much alcohol leads to a lot of misery and any cocaine at all may make you a slave for life. Again, let's not forget other creatures. Cats seem to be able to go to sleep anywhere, at any time. This surprisingly simple compound, isolated from the cerebrospinal fluid of cats, appears to be part of their sleep control mechanism. It makes them, or rats, or humans fall asleep immediately. This compound is a derivative of fatty acids. Fatty acids in the diet are a popular preoccupation, and the good and bad qualities of saturated, monounsaturated, and polyunsaturated fatty acids are continually in the news. One of the many dietary molecules reckoned to have demonstrable anti-cancer activity is CLA, conjugated linoleic acid, which is found in dairy products and, most abundantly, in kangaroo meat. Resveratrol is another dietary component with beneficial effects. It may be responsible for the apparent ability of red wine to prevent heart disease. It is a quite different sort of organic compound, with two benzene rings. For a third edible molecule, how about vitamin C? This is an essential factor in your diet. That is why it is called a vitamin. And in the diet of other primates, guinea pigs, and fruit bats. Interestingly, other mammals possess the biochemical machinery to make it themselves. The disease scurvy, a degeneration of soft tissues from which sailors on the long voyages of past centuries suffered, results from a lack of vitamin C. It also is a universal antioxidant, scavenging for rogue reactive radicals and protecting damage to DNA. Some people think an extra-large intake may even protect against the common cold. To summarize, in this lecture, you have seen the organic molecules directly involved in some of your everyday activities. By completing this course, you will gain a better understanding of the principles of life on the molecular level. The following lecture will describe the relationship between organic chemistry and industry using specific examples. Thank you for your attention. Hello everyone, and welcome back to the introductory module on organic chemistry. In the previous lecture, we explored the connections between organic chemistry and our daily lives. Today, our focus shifts to the pivotal role organic chemistry plays in various industries. The previous lecture concluded by detailing the role of vitamin C in our diet. Vitamin C is manufactured on a huge scale by Roche, a Swiss company. All over the world, there are chemistry-based companies making organic molecules on scales varying from a few kilograms to thousands of tons per year. This is good news for students of organic chemistry. 
Knowing how molecules behave and how to make them is a skill in demand, and it is an international job market. The petrochemicals industry consumes huge amounts of crude oil. The largest refinery in the world, in Jamnagar, India, processes 200 million liters of crude oil every day. An alarmingly large proportion of this is still just burned as fuel, but some of it is purified or converted into organic compounds for use in the rest of the chemical industry. Some simple compounds are made both from oil and from plants. The ethanol used as a starting material to make other compounds in industry is largely made by the catalytic hydration of ethylene from oil. But ethanol is also used as a fuel, particularly in Brazil, where it is made by fermentation of sugar cane. Biodiesel is made in a similar way from the fatty acid components of plant oils. Plants are extremely powerful organic chemical factories, with sugar cane being among the most efficient of all of them. Photosynthesis extracts carbon dioxide directly from the air and uses solar energy to reduce it to form less oxygen-rich organic compounds from which energy can be re-extracted by combustion. Plastics and polymers take much of the production of the petrochemical industry in the form of monomers such as styrene, acrylates, and vinyl chloride. The products of this enormous industry are everything made of plastic, including solid plastics for household goods and furniture, fibers for clothes, elastic polymers for car tires, light bubble-filled polymers for packing, and so on. Worldwide, 100 million tons of polymers are made per year, and polyvinyl chloride manufacture alone employs over 50,000 people to make over 20 million tons per year. Many adhesives work by polymerization of monomers, which can be applied as a simple solution. You can glue almost anything with superglue, a polymer of methyl cyanoacrylate. Washing up bowls are made of the polymer polyethylene, but the detergent you put in them belongs to another branch of the chemical industry. Companies like Unilever, Procter & Gamble produce detergents, cleaners, bleaches, and polishes, along with soaps, gels, cosmetics, and shaving foams. These products may smell of lemon, lavender, or sandalwood, but they too mostly come from the oil industry. Products of this kind tend to underplay their petrochemical origins and claim affinity with the perceived freshness and cleanliness of the natural world. They also try to tell us, after a fashion, what they contain. Try this example. The list of contents from a well-known brand of shower gel, which we are reassuringly told is packed with natural stuff, including tin, real, lemons, and contains 100% pure and natural lemon and tea tree essential oils. The particular detergents, surfactants, acids, viscosity controllers, and so on are chosen to blend together to give a smooth gel. The result should feel, smell, and look attractive and work as an effective detergent and shampoo. In this sense, the yellow color and lemon scent are considered fresh and clean by the customer. Notably, several of the ingredients are added as pure compounds. The ones which are not are mixtures of isomers or polymers. The most impure ingredients are the mixtures of hydrocarbons referred to as the pure and natural essential oils. So, is it packed with natural stuff? Indeed, it is. It all comes from natural sources, the principal one being decomposed carboniferous forests trapped for millions of years underground. I certainly hope this course will set you on the path of understanding the sense and the nonsense of this sort of thing. The coloration of manufactured goods is a huge business, with a range of intense colors required for dyeing cloth, coloring plastic and paper, painting walls, and so on. One of the most commonly used dye stuffs is indigo, an ancient dye that used to be isolated from plants but is now made from petrochemical feedstocks. It is the color of blue jeans. More modern dye stuffs can be represented by benzodiphyranones, thalocyanine metal complexes, and diketoperolopyrroles, often abbreviated as DPPs. The benzodiphyranones, developed by ICI, are used for coloring synthetic fabrics such as polyesters. Thalocyanine metal complexes typically produce blue or green hues, while the high-performance pigments from the DPP series, developed by Sibigaigi, are red. The scent of the shower gel mentioned earlier came from a mixture of plant extracts, with the key ingredient being citral. 
Major fragrance and flavoring companies handle both natural and synthetic ingredients. Naturals are mixtures of compounds extracted from plants. Synthetics are single compounds, sometimes present in plant-derived sources and sometimes newly designed molecules, which are mixed with each other and with natural compounds to create a scent. A typical perfume will contain 5-10% to fragrance molecules in an ethanol water mixture. So, the perfumery industry needs a very large amount of ethanol and, you might think, not much perfumery material. In fact, important fragrances like jasmine are produced on a 10,000 tons per annum scale. The cost of a pure perfume ingredient like cisjasmone, the main ingredient of jasmine, may be several hundred pounds, dollars, or euros per gram. Chemists produce synthetic flavorings such as smoky bacon and even chocolate. Meaty flavors come from simple heterocycles such as alkyl pyrazines, present in coffee as well as roast meat, and furanol, originally found in pineapples. Compounds such as corylone and maltol give caramel and meaty flavors. Mixtures of these and other synthetic compounds can be tuned to taste like many roasted foods from fresh bread to coffee and barbecued meat. Some flavoring compounds are also perfumes and may also be used as an intermediate in making other compounds. Vanillin is the main component of the flavor of vanilla but is manufactured on a large scale for many other uses too. Food chemistry includes much larger scale items than flavors. Sweeteners such as sugar itself are isolated from plants on an enormous scale. You saw sucrose earlier but other sweeteners such as saccharin and aspartame are made on a sizable scale. Aspartame is a compound of two of the natural amino acids present in all living things and over 10,000 tons per annum are made by the NutraSweet company. One of the great revolutions of modern life has been the expectation that humans will survive diseases because of a specifically designed treatment. In the developed world, People live to old age because infections which used to kill can now be cured or kept at bay. Antibiotics are our defense against bacteria, preventing them from multiplying. One of the most successful of these is amoxicillin, which was developed by SmithKline. The four-membered ring at the heart of the molecule is the beta-lactam, which targets the disease-causing bacteria. Medicinal chemists also protect us from the insidious threat of viruses which use the body's own biochemistry to replicate. Tamiflu is a line of defense against the ever-present danger of a flu epidemic, while ritonavir is one of the most advanced drugs designed to prevent replication of HIV and to slow down or prevent the onset of AIDS. The best-selling current drugs are largely designed to address the human body's own failings. Sales of Lipitor and Nexium both topped 1.3 billion US dollars in 2022, figures which serve to illustrate the financial scale of developing safe and effective new treatments. Lipitor is one of the class of drugs known as statins, widely prescribed to control cholesterol levels in older people. Nexium is a proton pump inhibitor, which works to reduce peptic and duodenal ulcers. We cannot maintain our present high density of population in the developed world, nor deal with malnutrition in the developing world unless we preserve our food supply from attacks by insects and fungi and from competition by weeds. The world market for agrochemicals produced by multinationals such as Bayer Crop Science and Syngenta is over 15 billion US dollars per annum divided between herbicides, fungicides, and insecticides. Many of the early agrochemicals were phased out as they were persistent environmental pollutants. Modern agrochemicals have to pass stringent environmental safety tests. The most famous modern insecticides are based on the plant-derived pyrethrins, modified chemically to stabilize them against degradation in sunlight, as demonstrated in decamethrin by the brown and green portions. Decamethrin has a safety profile that is 10,000 times safer for mustard beetles than for mammals, can be applied at a rate of only 10 grams per hectare, and leaves no significant environmental residue. As you learn more chemistry, you will appreciate how remarkable it is that nature should produce the three-membered rings in these compounds, and that chemists should use them in bulk compounds to be sprayed on crops and fields. Even more remarkable in some ways are the fungicides based on a five-membered ring containing three nitrogen atoms, the triazole ring. These compounds inhibit an enzyme present in fungi but not in plants or animals.
Fungal diseases are a real threat. As in the Irish potato famine of the 19th century, the various fungal blights, blotches, rots, rusts, smuts, and mildews can overwhelm any crop in a short time. All the compounds I have shown you are built up on hydrocarbon skeletons. Most have oxygen or nitrogen as well. Some have sulfur and some phosphorus, and maybe the halogens. These are the main elements of organic chemistry. But organic chemistry has also benefited from the exploration of the rest of the periodic table. The organic chemistry of silicon, boron, lithium, tin, copper, zinc, and palladium has been particularly well studied and these elements are common constituents of organic reagents used in the laboratory. You will meet many of them throughout this course. Butylithium, trimethylsilyl chloride, tributyltin hydride, diethyl zinc, and lithium dimethylcuprate provide examples. The halogens also appear in many life-saving drugs. Antiviral compounds such as phyaluridine, which contains both fluorine and iodine, as well as nitrogen and oxygen, are essential for the fight against HIV and AIDS. They are modeled on natural compounds from nucleic acids. The naturally occurring cytotoxic and anti-tumor agent Halomon, extracted from red algae, contains bromine and chlorine. The organic chemist's periodic table would have to emphasize all of these elements and more. New connections are being added all the time. Before the end of the last century, the organic chemistry of ruthenium, gold, and samarium was negligible. Now reagents and catalysts incorporating these metals drive a wide range of important reactions. So where does inorganic chemistry end and organic chemistry begin? Would you say that the antiviral compound phosgranate was organic? It is a compound of carbon with the formula CPO5-sodium-3, but it has no CH bonds. And what about the important reagent tetrakis triphenylphosphine palladium? It has lots of hydrocarbon. 12 benzene rings in fact, but the benzene rings are all joined to phosphorus atoms that are arranged in a square around the central palladium atom. So the molecule is held together by carbon phosphorus and phosphorus palladium bonds, not by a hydrocarbon skeleton. Although it has the very organic looking formula, C72, H60, P4, palladium, many people would say it is inorganic. But is it? The answer is that we don't know and we don't care. Strict boundaries between traditional disciplines are undesirable and meaningless. Chemistry continues across the old boundaries between organic chemistry and inorganic chemistry, organic chemistry and physical chemistry or materials, or organic chemistry and biochemistry. Be glad that the boundaries are indistinct as that means the chemistry is all the richer. These lovely molecules belong to chemistry. To sum it up, I have told you about organic chemistry's history, the types of compounds it concerns itself with, the things it makes, and the elements it uses. Organic chemistry today is the study of the structure and reactions of compounds in nature, of compounds in the fossil reserves such as coal and oil, and of those compounds that can be made from them. Organic compounds will usually be constructed with a hydrocarbon framework, but will also often have atoms such as oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus, silicon, boron, halogens, and metals attached to them. Organic chemistry is used in the making of plastics, paints, dye stuffs, clothes, foodstuffs, human and veterinary medicines, agrochemicals, and many other things. This course is about all the things described here. It is about the structures of organic molecules and the reasons behind those structures. It is about the shapes of organic molecules and how the shape relates to their function, especially in the context of biology. It explains how organic structures and shapes are discovered. It tells you about the reactions the molecules undergo and, more importantly, how and why they behave in the way they do. It tells you about nature and about industry. It tells you how molecules are made and how you too can think about making molecules. This is the landscape through which you are about to travel. And, as with any journey to somewhere new, exciting, and sometimes challenging, the first thing is to make sure you have at least some knowledge of the local language. Fortunately, the language of organic chemistry could not be simpler. It is all pictures. The following lectures will get us communicating. Thank you for your attention.
Hello everyone, and welcome back to the introductory module on organic chemistry. In the previous lectures, I discussed the role of organic chemistry in our everyday lives, highlighted the importance of organic molecules in industry, and described the most important chemical elements involved in organic molecules. In this lecture, you are going to learn the main principles of drawing organic compounds. There are over 100 elements in the periodic table, and many molecules contain well over 100 atoms. For example, palatoxin, a naturally occurring compound with potential anti-cancer activity, was historically used to poison spear points. It is one of the most toxic compounds known, requiring only about 0.15 micrograms per kilogram for death by injection. Palatoxin contains 129 carbon atoms, 221 hydrogen atoms, 54 oxygen atoms, and 3 nitrogen atoms. This demonstrates the enormous variety of chemical structures, providing a rich diversity of molecules capable of forming even the most complicated living creatures. But how can we understand what seems like a recipe for confusion? Faced with the collection of atoms we call a molecule, how can we make sense of what we see? This and the following lectures will teach you how to interpret organic structures. I will also teach you how to draw organic molecules in a way that conveys all the necessary information and none of the superfluous. You should take this topic seriously as it is the language of organic chemistry and the most important tool used by chemists to communicate their ideas and results. Organic chemistry is the study of compounds that contain carbon. Nearly all organic compounds also contain hydrogen, most also contain oxygen, nitrogen, or other elements. Organic chemistry concerns itself with the way in which these atoms are bonded together into stable molecular structures and the way in which these structures change in the course of chemical reactions. Some molecular structures are shown here. These molecules are all amino acids, the constituents of proteins. Look at the number of carbon atoms in each molecule and the way they are bonded together. Even within this small class of molecules, there is great variety. Glycine and alanine have only two or three carbon atoms. Phenylalanine has nine. Lysine has a chain of atoms, while tryptophan has rings. In methionine, the atoms are arranged in a single chain. In leucine, the chain is branched. In proline, the chain bends back on itself to form a ring. Yet all of these molecules have similar properties. They are all soluble in water. They are all both acidic and basic. They can all be joined with other amino acids to form proteins. I will return to amino acids as examples several times in this module, but I will leave detailed discussions of their chemistry to later modules when we will be looking at the way they polymerize to form peptides and proteins. The chemistry of organic molecules depends much less on the number or the arrangement of carbon or hydrogen atoms than on the other types of atoms in the molecule. We call parts of molecules containing small collections of other atoms like oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur, functional groups. This is simply because they are groups of atoms that determine the way the molecule works. All amino acids contain two functional groups, an amino group and a carboxylic acid group. Some contain other functional groups as well. That is not to say the carbon atoms are not important. They simply play a different role compared to those of the oxygen, nitrogen, and other atoms to which they are attached. Organic molecules left to decompose for millions of years in the absence of light and oxygen become literally carbon skeletons. Crude oil, for example, is a mixture of molecules consisting of nothing but carbon and hydrogen, while coal consists of little else but carbon. Although the molecules in coal and oil differ widely in chemical structure, they have one thing in common, no functional groups. We can consider the chains and rings of carbon atoms we find in molecules as their skeletons, which support the functional groups and allow them to take part in chemical interactions. Much as your skeleton supports your internal organs so they can interact with one another and work properly. We will see later how the interpretation of organic structures as hydrocarbon frameworks supporting functional groups helps us to understand and rationalize the reactions of organic molecules. It also helps us to devise simple and clear ways of representing molecules on paper. You saw these structural diagrams in the previous lectures, and in the following I will teach you ways to draw 
and ways not to draw molecules. Below is another organic structure. Again, you may be familiar with the molecule it represents. It is a fatty acid commonly called linoleic acid. Three fatty acid molecules and one glycerol molecule combine to form the fats that store energy in our bodies and are used to construct the membranes around our cells. This particular fatty acid, linoleic acid, cannot be synthesized in the human body but must be an essential component of a healthy diet found, for example, in sunflower oil. Fatty acids differ in the length of their chains of carbon atoms, yet they have very similar chemical properties because they all contain the carboxylic acid functional group. We shall come back to fatty acids in a later module. We could also depict linoleic acid using the following two structures. You may have seen diagrams like these in older books. In the days before computers, they were easy to print because all the atoms were in a line and all the angles were 90 degrees. However, are they realistic? The picture below shows the structure of linoleic acid determined by X-ray crystallography. X-ray crystallography discovers the structures of molecules by observing the way X-rays bounce off atoms in crystalline solids. It gives clear diagrams with the atoms marked as circles and the bonds as rods joining them together. We will consider ways of determining the shapes and structures of molecules in more detail in a separate module. You can see that the chain of carbon atoms is not linear, but a zigzag. Although our diagram is just a two-dimensional representation of this three-dimensional structure, it seems reasonable to draw it as a zigzag too. This gives us our first guideline for drawing organic structures, draw chains of atoms as zigzags. Realism, of course, has its limits. The X-ray structure reveals that the linoleic acid molecule is slightly bent in the vicinity of the double bonds. Although I have depicted it as a straight zigzag, this representation is an approximation. Upon close inspection of crystal structures like this, we find that the angle of the zigzag is about 109 degrees when the carbon atom is not part of a double bond and 120 degrees when it is. The 109 degree angle is known as the tetrahedral angle, representing the angle between two vertices of a tetrahedron when viewed from its center. In the module on the structure of organic molecules, we will explore why carbon atoms adopt this particular arrangement of bonds. Our realistic drawing is a projection of a three-dimensional structure onto flat paper, so we must make compromises. When drawing organic structures, we aim to achieve realism without including unnecessary detail. To illustrate, consider these three pictures. The first is immediately recognizable as Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa. The second, also Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa, may not be as easily identifiable as it is a top-down view. Although the frame is ornate, it does not provide as much insight into the painting as our rejected linear and 90-degree angle diagrams did for our fatty acid. While each representation has its correctness, they ultimately lack utility. What we require when depicting molecules is akin to the third picture, conveying the essence of the original while including only the necessary details for recognition and omitting the rest. Furthermore, it is important to note that efficiency matters. The third picture was drawn in less than 10 minutes. We simply do not have the luxury of time to create elaborate works of art. Since functional groups are the key to the chemistry of molecules, Clear diagrams must emphasize the functional groups and let the hydrocarbon framework fade into the background. Just compare the diagrams shown here. The second structure is the way that most organic chemists would draw linoleic acid. Notice how the important carboxylic acid functional group stands out clearly and is no longer cluttered by all those carbons and hydrogens. The zigzag pattern of the chain is much clearer too and this structure is much quicker to draw than any of the previous ones. To get this diagram from the one above, we have done two things. Firstly, we have got rid of all the hydrogen atoms attached to carbon atoms, along with the bonds joining them to the carbon atoms. Even without drawing the hydrogen atoms, we know they are there. We assume that any carbon atom that does not appear to have its potential for four bonds satisfied is also attached to the appropriate number of hydrogen atoms. Secondly, we have rubbed out all the C's representing carbon atoms. We are left with a zigzag line, 
and we assume that every kink in the line represents a carbon atom, as does the end of the line. In other words, for economical drawing, we omit the capital, C's representing carbon atoms, and the H's attached to carbon atoms unless there is a good reason not to omit them. You may wonder, what constitutes a good reason not to omit carbon and hydrogen atoms? One reason is if the carbon or hydrogen atom is part of a functional group. Another reason is if the carbon or hydrogen atom needs to be highlighted, such as when it participates in a reaction. These guidelines are not strict rules. Rather, they are flexible. If including them aids clarification, include them. If it adds clutter and confusion, leave them out. However, remember this. If you represent a carbon atom with the letter C, you must also include all associated hydrogen atoms. If you do not wish to depict all the hydrogens, avoid using Cs to represent carbon. Try drawing some of the amino acids shown earlier in a similar way, using the guidelines introduced. The bond angles at tetrahedral carbon atoms are about 109 degrees, so aim to represent them as such when projected onto a plane. In fact, a compromise of 120 degrees tends to make the drawings look neater. Let's start with leucine. When I introduced leucine, I depicted its structure as shown here. Pause the lecture, grab a piece of paper, and give it a try now. Once you have completed your drawing, resume the video lecture to compare your rendition with my suggestions. Here you are. It does not matter which way up you have drawn it but your diagram should look something like one of these structures representing the molecule of leucine. The guidelines I gave were only guidelines, not rules, and it certainly does not matter which way round you draw the molecule. The aim is to keep the functional groups clear and let the skeleton fade into the background. That is why the last two structures are all right. The carbon atom shown as C is part of a functional group, the carboxyl group, so it can stand out. Now pause the lecture and try redrawing some of the other eight structures shown here using the guidelines. Do not look at my suggestions and what follows until you have done the drawing. Once you have finished drawing, compare your drawings with my suggestions. Remember that these are only suggestions. But I hope you will agree that this style of diagram looks much less cluttered and makes the functional groups much clearer than the diagram shown earlier. Moreover, my drawings still bear a significant resemblance to the real thing. For example, compare these crystal structures of lysine and tryptophan with the structures you saw earlier. You will probably find that you want to draw the same molecule in different ways on different occasions to emphasize different points. Let's carry on using leucine as an example. I mentioned before that an amino acid can act as an acid or a base. When it acts as an acid, a base, such as hydroxide, removes protons from the carboxylic acid group in a reaction represented as shown here. The product of this reaction features a negative charge on an oxygen atom, which I have highlighted within a circle for clarity. I recommend employing this method when representing charges, as plus and minus signs can sometimes be easily misplaced. We will delve into this type of reaction, as well as the techniques for drawing reactions and understanding the significance of curly arrows and diagrams in the module dedicated to organic reactions. For now, take note that I depicted the carboxyl group as the fragment on the left to illustrate the breaking of the OH bond when the base attacked. I adapted my diagram to suit the specific purposes of my explanation. When leucine acts as a base, the amino group is involved. The nitrogen atom attaches itself to a proton, forming a new bond using its lone pair. A lone pair is a pair of electrons that is not involved in a chemical bond. We will discuss lone pairs in detail later. Notice how I drew in the lone pair this time because I wanted to show its involvement in the reaction. Although the oxygen atoms of the carboxylic acid group also have lone pairs, I did not draw them in because they were not relevant to the discussion. Additionally, I did not feel it was necessary to draw the carboxyl group in full this time because none of its atoms or bonds were involved in the reaction. Of course, all the structures we have been drawing give only an idea of the real structure of the molecules. For example, 
The carbon atom between the amino group and the carboxyl group of leucine has a tetrahedral arrangement of atoms around it, a fact which we have so far completely ignored. We might want to emphasize this fact by drawing in the hydrogen atom we missed out at this point, as in structure one. We can then show that one of the groups attached to this carbon atom comes towards us, out of the plane of the paper, and the other one goes away from us, into the paper. There are several ways of doing this. In structure two, the bold, wedge bond suggests a perspective view of a bond coming towards you, while the hashed bond suggests a bond fading away from you. The other two normal bonds are in the plane of the paper. Alternatively, we could miss out the hydrogen atom and draw something a bit neater, although slightly less realistic, as in structure three. We can assume the missing hydrogen atom is behind the plane of the paper because that is where the missing vertex of the tetrahedron of atoms attached to the carbon atom lies. When you draw diagrams like these to indicate the three-dimensional shape of the molecule, try to keep the hydrocarbon framework in the plane of the paper and allow functional groups and other branches to project forwards out of the paper or backwards into it. These conventions allow us to convey an idea of the three-dimensional shape stereochemistry of any organic molecule. You have already seen them in use in the diagram depicting the structure of palatoxin at the beginning of this lecture. It is important to note that we will delve into more detail regarding the shapes of molecules in the module dedicated to stereochemistry. The guidelines I have given and the conventions I have illustrated in this lecture have grown up over decades. They are not arbitrary pronouncements by some official body, but are used by organic chemists because they work. I will follow them for the rest of the course. Try to follow them yourself whenever you draw an organic structure. Before you ever draw a capital C or a capital H again, ask yourself whether it is really necessary. Now that we have considered how to draw structures, we can return to some of the structural types that we find in organic molecules. Firstly, I will talk about hydrocarbon frameworks, then about functional groups. Thank you for your attention. Hello everyone, and welcome back to the introductory module on organic chemistry. In the previous lecture, you were introduced to the common language of organic chemistry, and you learned how to draw organic molecules. Organic structural drawings should be realistic, economical, and clear. I provided you with several guidelines to help you achieve this when drawing structures. You were recommended to draw chains of atoms as zigzags. When drawing organic structures, you should omit the hydrogens attached to the carbon atoms, along with the CH bonds, as well as the capital C's representing carbon atoms. Additionally, we discussed that organic compounds are composed of functional groups and a hydrocarbon framework. Functional groups determine the molecule's chemical and biological functions, while the hydrocarbon framework consists of chains and rings of carbon atoms, providing support for the functional groups. In this lecture, we will focus on various types of hydrocarbon frameworks. Carbon as an element is unique in the variety of structures it can form. It is unusual because it forms strong, stable bonds to the majority of elements in the periodic table, including itself. It is this ability to form bonds to itself that leads to the variety of organic structures that exist and indeed to the possibility of life existing at all. Carbon may make up only 0.2% of the Earth's crust, but it certainly deserves a whole branch of chemistry all to itself. The simplest class of hydrocarbon frameworks contains just chains of atoms. For example, the fatty acid you met earlier have hydrocarbon framework made of zigzag chain of atoms. Polyethylene is a polymer whose hydrocarbon framework consists entirely of chains of carbon atoms. The wiggly line at each end of this structure shows that I have drawn a piece in the middle of the polyethylene molecule. The structure continues indefinitely beyond the wiggly lines. At the other end of the spectrum of complexity is this antibiotic, extracted from a fungus in 1995 and aptly named linearmycin as it has a long linear chain. The chain of this antibiotic is so long that I had to wrap it around two corners just to fit it on the screen. Notice that I have drawn four groups as CH3. I did this to ensure they are not overlooked in such a large structure. 
They are the only small branches off this long, winding trunk. I have not indicated whether the CH3 and OH groups are in front of or behind the plane of the paper because, at the time of preparing this lecture, the stereochemistry of linear mycin is unknown. It is often convenient to refer to a chain of carbon atoms by a name indicating its length. You have probably met some of these names before in the names of the simplest organic molecules, the alkanes. There are also commonly used abbreviations for these names. These can be very useful in both writing about chemistry and in drawing chemical structures, as you will see shortly. The names for shorter chains, which you must learn, exist for historical reasons, while for chains of five or more carbon atoms, the systematic names are based on Greek number names. You may notice that the abbreviations for the names of carbon chains look very much like the symbols for chemical elements. This is deliberate, and these symbols are sometimes called organic elements. They can be used in chemical structures just like element symbols. It is often convenient to use the organic element symbols for short carbon chains for tidiness. Here are some examples. Structure 1 shows how we drew the structure of the amino acid methionine. The stick representing the methyl group attached to the sulfur atom does, however, look a little odd. Most chemists would draw methionine as structure 2, with Me representing the CH3 methyl group. Tetraethyl lead used to be added to petrol to prevent engines knocking until it was shown to be a health hazard. Its structure, as you might easily guess from the name, is easy to write as lead ethyl 4. Remember that these abbreviated symbols and names can only be used for terminal chains of atoms. For example, I could not abbreviate the structure of lysine as you see under structure 3 because we can only use the symbol bu for the terminal butyl group. Before moving on from carbon chains, I must mention another very useful organic element symbol, R. In a structure, R can represent anything. It is a sort of wild card. For example, in structure 6, R could denote any amino acid. If R equals hydrogen, the amino acid would be glycine. If R is methyl, it would be alanine, and so on. As I mentioned before, and as you will see later, the reactivity of organic molecules is so dependent on their functional groups that the rest of the molecule can be irrelevant. In such cases, we can simply refer to the rest of the molecule as R. Rings of atoms are also common in organic structures. You may have heard the famous story of Auguste Kekulé first realizing that benzene has a ring structure when he dreamed of a snake biting its own tail. You have met benzene rings in phenylalanine and aspirin. Paracetamol also has a structure based on a benzene ring. When a benzene ring is attached to a molecule by only one of its carbon atoms, as in phenylalanine, but not paracetamol or aspirin, we can call it a phenyl group and give it the organic element symbol pH. Any compound containing a benzene ring or a related ring system is known as aromatic, and another useful organic element symbol related to phenyl is AR for aryl. While phenyl always refers to the molecular formula, C6H5, aryl can represent any substituted phenyl ring, meaning phenyl with any number of hydrogen atoms replaced by other groups. Of course, AR is also an abbreviation for the chemical element argon, but there is no confusion as there are no organic compounds of argon. For example, while phenyl OH always denotes phenol, aryl OH could represent phenol, 2, 4, 6 trichlorophenol, paracetamol, or aspirin, among many other substituted phenols. Just like R, the wild card alkyl group, aryl is a wild card aryl group. The compound known as muscone has only relatively recently been made in the laboratory. It is the pungent aroma that makes up the base note of musk fragrances. Before chemists had determined its structure and devised a laboratory synthesis, the only source of musk was the musk deer, now rare for this very reason. Muscone skeleton is a 13-membered ring of carbon atoms. The steroid hormones typically have several, usually four, rings fused together. These hormones include testosterone and estradiol, which are important male and female sex hormones in humans. A reminder, Solid wedge-shaped bonds represent bonds coming towards us out of the screen, while cross-hatched bonds represent bonds going back into the screen away from us. 
Some ring structures are much more complicated. The potent poison strychnin is a tangle of interconnecting rings. One of the most elegant ring structures is shown here and is known as Buckminster Fuller Ring. It is named after the American inventor and architect Richard Buckminster Fuller, who designed the structures known as geodesic domes. Buckminster Fuller Ring consists solely of 60 carbon atoms arranged in rings that curve back on themselves to form a football-shaped cage. Count the number of bonds at any junction, and you will see that they add up to four, so no hydrogens need to be added. Accordingly, the molecular formula of Buckminster Fullerene is C60. Note that it might be difficult to see all the atoms as some are behind the sphere. Rings of carbon atoms are given names starting with cyclo, followed by the name for the carbon chain with the same number of carbon atoms. Structure 1 shows chrysanthemic acid, part of the naturally occurring pesticides called pyrethrins, which contains a cyclopropane ring. Propane has three carbon atoms. Cyclopropane is a three-membered ring. Brandisol, structure two, an insect pheromone used by male boll weevils to attract females, has a structure based on a cyclobutane ring. Butane has four carbon atoms and cyclobutane is a four-membered ring. Cyclamate, structure three, formerly used as an artificial sweetener, contains a cyclohexane ring. Hexane has six carbon atoms, so cyclohexane is a six-membered ring. Hydrocarbon frameworks rarely consist of single rings or chains. They are often branched. Rings, chains, and branches are combined in structures like that of the marine toxin palatoxin, which we encountered in the previous lecture. Other relevant examples are polystyrene, a polymer made of six-membered rings dangling from linear carbon chains, or beta-carotene, the compound that gives carrots their orange color. Just like some short straight carbon chains, some short branched carbon chains are given names and organic element symbols. The most common is the isopropyl group. Lithium disopropylamide, also called LDA, is a strong base commonly used in organic synthesis, and the isopropyl groups in LDA are commonly abbreviated as IPR. Notice how the propyl part of isopropyl still indicates three carbon atoms. They are just joined together in a different way, in other words, as an isomer of the straight chain propyl group. Sometimes, to avoid confusion, the straight chain alkyl groups are called N-alkyl to distinguish them from their branched counterparts. Examples include N-propyl and N-butyl, where N denotes normal. Another example of an organic molecule possessing an isopropyl group is iproniazid which is an antidepressant drug with IPR in both structure and name. When discussing isomers, we refer to molecules that consist of the same types and quantities of atoms but are arranged differently. Inpropanol and isopropanol are isomeric alcohols. Isomers need not have the same functional groups. These compounds are all isomers with the molecular formula, C4H8O. The isobutyl group, abbreviated as IBU, consists of a CH2 group joined to an isopropyl group. Two isobutyl groups are present in the reducing agent diisobutyl aluminium hydride, alternatively known as dibel. The painkiller ibuprofen contains an isobutyl group. Notice how the invented name ibuprofen is a medley of ibu from isobutyl, pro, for propyl, representing the three carbon units shown in brown, and fin for the phenyl ring. I will discuss the naming conventions of compounds later in this module. There are two more isomers of the butyl group, both of which have common names and abbreviations. The secondary butyl group, abbreviated as SBU, has a methyl and an ethyl group joined to the same carbon atom. It appears in an organolithium compound, secondary butyl lithium, used for lithiation in organic synthesis. The tertiary butyl or tert butyl group, abbreviated as TBU, has three methyl groups joined to the same carbon atom. Two tert butyl groups are found in butylated hydroxytoluene, BHT, an antioxidant added to some processed foods. The prefixes sec and tert are really short for secondary and tertiary, terms that refer to the carbon atom that attaches these groups to the rest of the molecular structure. A primary carbon atom is attached to only one other carbon atom, a secondary to two other carbon atoms, and so on. This means there are five types of carbon atom. 
These names for bits of hydrocarbon framework are more than just useful ways of writing or talking about chemistry. They convey fundamental information about the molecule, and I will utilize these terms when describing reactions. This quick architectural tour of some of the molecular edifices built by nature and by humans serves just as an introduction to some of the hydrocarbon frameworks you will meet in the rest of this course. Yet, fortunately for us, however complicated the hydrocarbon framework might be, it serves only as a support for the functional groups. And, by and large, a functional group in one molecule behaves in much the same way as it does in another molecule. In the following lecture, I will introduce you to some functional groups and explain why their attributes are the key to understanding organic chemistry. Thank you for your attention and participation. Hello everyone, and welcome back to the introductory module on organic chemistry. So far, you have been introduced to the main structural features of organic molecules. You saw that organic compounds are composed of functional groups and a hydrocarbon framework. Functional groups determine the molecule's chemical and biological functions, while the hydrocarbon framework consists of chains and rings of carbon atoms, providing support for the functional groups. If you bubble ethane gas through acids, bases, oxidizing agents, reducing agents, in fact almost any chemical you can think of, it will remain unchanged. Just about the only thing you can do with it is burn it. Yet ethanol not only burns, but it also reacts with acids, bases, and oxidizing agents. The difference between ethanol and ethane is the functional group, the OH, or hydroxyl group. We know that these chemical properties, being able to react with acids, bases, and oxidizing agents, are properties of the hydroxyl group and not just of ethanol because other compounds containing OH groups, in other words, other alcohols, have similar properties, whatever their hydrocarbon frameworks. The reaction of ethanol with oxidizing agents makes vinegar from wine and sober people from drunk ones. In both cases, the oxidizing agent is oxygen from the air, catalyzed by an enzyme in a living system. The oxidation of ethanol by microorganisms that grow in wine left open to the air leads to acetic acid while the oxidation of ethanol by the liver gives acetaldehyde. The human metabolism makes use of the oxidation of alcohols to render harmless other toxic compounds containing the OH group. For example, lactic acid, produced in muscles during intense activity, is oxidized by an enzyme called lactate dehydrogenase to the metabolically useful compound pyruvic acid. Your understanding of functional groups will be the key to your understanding of organic chemistry. We will, therefore, now proceed to discuss some of the most important functional groups. I will not delve into the properties of each group extensively in this module. That will be covered in later modules. Your task at this stage is to learn to recognize functional groups when they appear in structures, so make sure you learn their names. The classes of compounds associated with some functional groups also have names. For example, compounds containing the hydroxyl group are known as alcohols. Learn these names too as they are more important than the systematic names of individual compounds. Among others, I will provide brief information about each group to help you understand its characteristics. The alkanes are the simplest class of organic molecules because they contain no functional groups. They are extremely unreactive and therefore rather boring as far as the organic chemist is concerned. However, their underactivity can be a bonus, and alkanes such as pentane and hexane are often used as solvents, especially for the purification of organic compounds. Just about the only thing alkanes will do is burn, methane, propane, and butane are all used as domestic fuels, and petrol is a mixture of alkanes containing largely isooctane. It may seem strange to classify a type of bond as a functional group, but you will see later that carbon-carbon double bonds impart reactivity to an organic molecule just as functional groups consisting of, say, oxygen or nitrogen atoms do. Some of the compounds produced by plants and used by perfumers are alkanes. For example, Pinene has a smell evocative of pine forests, while limonene smells of citrus fruits. You have already met the orange pigment beta-carotene. 
Its structure consists mainly of 11 carbon-carbon double bonds. Colored organic compounds often contain chains or rings of carbon-carbon double bonds like this. In the module devoted to delocalization and conjugation, you will find out why this is so. Just like carbon-carbon double bonds, carbon-carbon triple bonds have a special type of reactivity associated with them, so it is useful to call a carbon-carbon triple bond a functional group. Alkynes are linear, so we draw them with four carbon atoms in a straight line. Alkynes are not as widespread in nature as alkenes, but one fascinating class of compounds containing carbon-carbon triple bonds is a group of anti-tumor agents discovered during the 1980s. Calichemicin is a member of this group. The high reactivity of this combination of functional groups enables calichemicin to attack DNA and prevent cancer cells from proliferating. Here, for the first time, I have drawn a molecule in three dimensions with two bonds crossing one another. Can you see the shape? In an alkane, each carbon atom is joined to four other atoms of carbon or hydrogen. It has no potential for forming more bonds and is therefore saturated. In alkenes, the carbon atoms making up the carbon-carbon double bond are attached to only three atoms each. They still have the potential to bond with one more atom and are therefore unsaturated. In general, carbon atoms attached to four other atoms are saturated. Those attached to three, two, or one are unsaturated. Remember that R may mean any alkyl group. We have already talked about the hydroxyl group in ethanol and other alcohols. Carbohydrates are peppered with hydroxyl groups. For example, sucrose has eight of them. Molecules containing hydroxyl groups are often soluble in water, and living things often attach sugar groups, containing hydroxyl groups, to otherwise insoluble organic compounds to keep them in solution in the cell. Calichemicin, a molecule I have just mentioned, contains a string of sugars for just this reason. The liver carries out its task of detoxifying unwanted organic compounds by repeatedly hydroxylating them until they are water-soluble and they are then excreted in the bile or urine. The name ether refers to any compound that has two alkyl groups linked through an oxygen atom. Ether is also used as an everyday name for diethyl ether. You might compare this use of the word ether with the common use of the word alcohol to mean ethanol. Diethyl ether is a highly flammable solvent that boils at only 35 degrees. It used to be used as an anesthetic. Tetrahydrofuran, abbreviated as THF, is another commonly used solvent and is a cyclic ether. Brevitoxin B is a fascinating naturally occurring compound that was synthesized in the laboratory in 1995. It is packed with ether functional groups and ring sizes from 6 to 8. Brevitoxin B is one of a family of polyethers found in the sea creature Gymnodinium breve, which sometimes multiplies at an amazing rate and creates red tides around the coast of the Gulf of Mexico. Fish die in large numbers, and people can also be affected if they consume shellfish that have ingested the red tide. The brevitoxins are the killers. Here, the many ether oxygen atoms interfere with sodium ion metabolism in the human body. We met the amino group when we were discussing the amino acids. I mentioned that it was this group that gave amino acids their basic properties. Amines often have powerful fishy smells. The smell of putrescine is particularly foul. It is formed as meat decays. Many neurologically active compounds are also amines. Amphetamine is a notorious stimulant. Nitro compounds contain the nitro group. The nitro group is sometimes incorrectly drawn with five bonds to nitrogen, which as you will see in the module devoted to the structure of molecules, is impossible. Make sure you draw it correctly when you need to draw it out in detail. If you write just NO2, you are all right. Several nitro groups in one molecule can make it quite unstable and even explosive. The most famous explosive of all, trinitrotoluene TNT, is formed by three nitro groups. However, functional groups refuse to be stereotyped. Nitrazepam also contains a nitro group, but this compound is marketed as Magadon, the sleeping pill. Alkyl halides contain the fluoro, chloro, bromo, or iodo groups. These four functional groups have similar properties, although alkyl iodides are the most reactive and alkyl fluorides the least. 
As alkyl halides have similar properties, chemists use yet another wild card organic element symbol, X, as a convenient substitute for chlorine, bromine, or iodide. Polyvinyl chloride is one of the most widely used polymers. It has a chloro group on every other carbon atom along a linear hydrocarbon framework. Methyl iodide, on the other hand, is a dangerous carcinogen since it reacts with DNA and can cause mutations in the genetic code. These compounds are also known as haloalkanes, fluoroalkanes, chloroalkanes, bromoalkanes, or iodoalkanes. Aldehydes and ketones contain the carbonyl group. Aldehydes can be formed by oxidizing alcohols. As I showed earlier, the liver detoxifies ethanol in the bloodstream by oxidizing it first to acetaldehyde, which is the cause of hangovers. Aldehydes often have pleasant smells. 2-methylundecanol is a key component of the fragrance of the perfume Chanel No. 5, and raspberry ketone is the major component of the flavor and smell of raspberries. As you probably guessed, carboxylic acids contain the carboxyl group. As their name implies, compounds containing the carboxylic acid group can react with bases, losing a proton to form carboxylate salts. Edible carboxylic acids have sharp flavors and are found in several fruits. For example, citric, malic, and tartaric acids are found in lemons, apples, and grapes, respectively. Esters contain a carboxyl group with an extra alkyl group. Fats are esters, in fact, they contain three ester groups. They are formed in the body by condensing glycerol, a compound with three hydroxyl groups, with three fatty acid molecules, oleic acid in this case. The terms saturated fats and unsaturated fats are familiar. They refer to whether the tails of the fatty acid are saturated or unsaturated. In the latter case, the fatty acids contain carbon-carbon double bonds. Fats containing several double bonds, for example, those that are esters formed from linoleic acid, which you met in the previous lectures, are known as polyunsaturated. Other, more volatile, esters have pleasant, fruity smells and flavors. These three are components of the flavors of bananas, rum, and apples. Proteins are amides. They are formed when the carboxylic acid group of one amino acid condenses with the amino group of another to form an amide linkage, also known as a peptide bond. One protein molecule can contain hundreds of amide bonds. Aspartame, the artificial sweetener marketed as NutraSweet, on the other hand, contains just two amino acids, aspartic acid and phenylalanine, joined through one amide bond. Paracetamol is also an amide. Nitriles or cyanides contain the cyano group consisting of a carbon-nitrogen triple bond. Nitrile groups can be introduced into molecules by reacting potassium cyanide with alkyl halides. The organic nitrile group has properties that are quite different from those of the lethal inorganic cyanide. Laetrile, for example, is extracted from apricot kernels and was once developed as an anti-cancer drug. The next functional group we will study is acyl chlorides. Acyl chlorides are reactive compounds used to make esters and amides. They are derivatives of carboxylic acids with the OH replaced by chloride and are too reactive to be found in nature. And finally, you should familiarize yourself with acetals. Acetals are compounds with two single-bonded oxygen atoms attached to the same carbon atom. Many sugars are acetals, as is laetrile, which was introduced earlier. You have seen that a functional group is essentially any deviation from an alkane structure, either because the molecule has fewer hydrogen atoms than an alkane or because it contains a collection of atoms that are not carbon and not hydrogen. There is a useful term for these different atoms. These atoms are called heteroatoms. A heteroatom is any atom in an organic molecule other than carbon or hydrogen. All functional groups are different but some are more different than others. For example, the structures of a carboxylic acid, an ester, an amide, and an acyl chloride are all very similar. In each case, the carbon atom carrying the functional group is bonded to two heteroatoms, one of the bonds being a double bond. You will see in a later module that this similarity in structure is mirrored in the reactions of these four types of compounds and in the ways in which they can be interconverted. Carboxylic acids, 
esters, and amides can be changed into one another by reaction with simple reagents such as water, alcohols, or amines, plus appropriate catalysts. Changing them into aldehydes or alcohols requires a different type of reagent, specifically, a reducing agent that adds hydrogen atoms. We say that the carbon atoms carrying functional groups that can be in turn converted without the need for reducing agents or oxidizing agents have the same oxidation level. In this case, we call it the carboxylic acid oxidation level. In fact, amides can quite easily be converted into nitriles just by dehydration, removal of water, so we must give nitrile carbon atoms the same oxidation level as carboxylic acids, esters, and amides. Maybe you are beginning to see the structural similarity between these four functional groups that you could have used to assign their oxidation level. In all four cases, the carbon atom has three bonds to heteroatoms and only one to carbon or hydrogen. It does not matter how many heteroatoms there are. What matters is how many bonds to the heteroatoms do we have. Having noticed this, we can also assign both carbon atoms and CFC-113 to the carboxylic acid oxidation level. CFC-113 is one of the environmentally unfriendly aerosol propellants that have caused damage to the Earth's ozone layer. Do not confuse oxidation level with oxidation state. Oxidation level is determined by the number of heteroatoms bonded to carbon while oxidation state is determined by the number of bonds to carbon including those to carbon and hydrogen. In all of these compounds, carbon has four bonds and is in oxidation state plus four. Aldehydes and ketones contain a carbon atom with two bonds to heteroatoms. They are at the aldehyde oxidation level. The common laboratory solvent dichloromethane also has two bonds to heteroatoms, so it too contains a carbon atom at the aldehyde oxidation level, as do acetals. Alcohols, ethers, and alkyl halides have a carbon atom with only one single bond to a heteroatom. We assign these the alcohol oxidation level, and they are all easily made from alcohols without oxidation or reduction. We must include simple alkanes, which have no bonds to heteroatoms, as part of the alkane oxidation level. The small class of compounds that have a carbon atom with four bonds to heteroatoms is related to CO2 and best described as at the carbon dioxide oxidation level. Alkenes and alkynes obviously do not fit easily into these categories as they have no bonds to heteroatoms. Alkenes can be made from alcohols by dehydration without any oxidation or reduction, so it seems sensible to put them in the alcohol column. Similarly, alkynes and aldehydes are related by hydration-dehydration reactions, which do not include oxidation or reduction. To sum it up, in this lecture you have been introduced to the most important functional groups found in organic molecules. We systematically discussed the functional groups presented here, and I associated them with real molecules and facts to help you remember them easily. Most of the functional groups present in organic compounds can be classified into several groups based on the oxidation level of the carbon atom present in the functional group. As a rule, functional groups belonging to the same oxidation level can be interconverted without the use of reducing or oxidizing agents. In the following lecture, I will focus on the main rules used for the systematic nomenclature of organic compounds. Thank you for your attention and I look forward to the following lecture. Greetings to all, and a warm welcome to the concluding lecture on the introductory module devoted to organic chemistry. So far, I have talked a lot about compounds by name. Many of the names I have used are simple names given to complicated molecules without regard for the actual structure or function of the molecule. For example, muscone and brevitoxin are derived from the names of the organisms from which the compounds were first extracted. They are known as trivial names, not because they are unimportant, but because they are used in everyday scientific conversation. Names like this are fine for familiar compounds that are widely used and referred to by chemists, biologists, doctors, nurses, and perfumers alike. But there are over 16 million known organic compounds. They cannot all have simple names, and no one would remember them if they did. 
For this reason, the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry, IUPAC, have developed systematic nomenclature, a set of rules that allows any compound to be given a unique name that can be deduced directly from its chemical structure. Conversely, a chemical structure can be deduced from its systematic name. The problem with systematic names is that they tend to be grotesquely unpronounceable for anything but the simplest molecules. In everyday speech and writing, chemists therefore do tend to disregard them and use a mixture of systematic and trivial names. Nonetheless, it is important to know how the rules work. We will look next at systematic nomenclature before going on to look at the real language of chemistry. There is not enough time here to explain all the rules for giving systematic names for compounds, as these rules fill several desperately dull volumes, and there is no point knowing all of the rules anyway since computers will handle the naming automatically. What I will do is to explain the principles underlying systematic nomenclature. You should understand these principles because they provide the basis for the names used by chemists for the vast majority of compounds that do not have their own trivial names. Systematic names can be divided into three parts. One describes the hydrocarbon framework, one describes the functional groups, and one indicates where the functional groups are attached to the skeleton. You have already encountered the names for some simple fragments of hydrocarbon frameworks, such as methyl, ethyl, propyl, etc. Adding a hydrogen atom to these alkyl fragments and changing the ending from IL to AIN creates the alkanes in their respective names. You should hardly need a reminder of their structures. The name of a functional group can be added to the name of a hydrocarbon framework either as a suffix or as a prefix. Some examples are shown here. It is important to count all of the carbon atoms in the chain, even if one of them is part of a functional group. In this sense, pentane nitrile can also be called butyl cyanide. Compounds with functional groups attached to a benzene ring are named in a similar way. For example, one can see here iodobenzene. Sometimes, a number can be included in the name to indicate which carbon atom the functional group is attached to. None of the structures listed here needed numbering, as the functional groups are either at the terminal carbon atom or in the middle of the hydrocarbon framework. When numbers are used, the carbon atoms are counted from one end. In most cases, either of two numbers could be used, depending on which end you count from. The one chosen is always the lower of the two. The examples shown here illustrate this point. Notice again that some functional groups are named with prefixes and some with suffixes, and that the number always precedes the functional group name directly. One carbon atom can have as many as four functional groups. This limit is reached with tetrabromomethane. Here are some other examples of compounds with more than one functional group. Again, the numbers indicate the distance of the functional groups from the end of the carbon chain. Counting must always start from the same end for each functional group. Notice how I use the prefixes D, tri, and tetra if there is more than one of the same functional group. With cyclic compounds, there is no end of the chain, but we can use numbers to show the distance between the two groups. You should start counting from the carbon atom carrying one of the functional groups, then proceed around the ring. These rules apply to hydrocarbon frameworks that are chains or rings, but many skeletons are branched. We can name these by treating the branch as though it were a functional group. With substituted benzene rings, an alternative way of identifying the positions of the substituents is to use the terms ortho, meta, and para, which are often abbreviated as O, M, and P, respectively. Ortho compounds are 1, 2, di substituted. Meta compounds are 1, 3, di substituted, and para compounds are 1, 4, di substituted. The example shown here should make this clear. The terms ortho, meta, and para are used by chemists because they are easier to remember than numbers, and the words carry with them chemical meaning. Ortho shows that two groups are next to each other on the ring even though the atoms may not happen to be numbered 1 and 2. They are one example of the way in which chemists do not always use systematic nomenclature, but revert to more convenient, trivial terms. The point of naming a compound is to be able to communicate with other chemists. Most chemists are happiest communicating chemistry by means of structural diagrams, 
and structural drawings are far more important than any sort of chemical nomenclature. That is why I explained in detail how to draw structures, but only gave an outline of how to name compounds. Good diagrams are easy to understand, quick to draw, and difficult to misinterpret. But we do need to be able to communicate by speech and by writing as well. In principle, we could do this by using systematic names. In practice, however, the full systematic names of anything but the simplest molecules are far too clumsy for use in everyday chemical speech. Instead, there are several alternatives, mostly based on a mixture of trivial and systematic names. A few simple compounds are called by trivial names not because the systematic names are complicated, but just out of habit. We know them so well that we use their familiar names. You may have met the underlying compound before and perhaps called it ethanoic acid, its systematic name. But in a chemical laboratory, everyone would refer to this acid as acetic acid, its trivial name. The same is true for all these common substances. I have not asked you to remember any trivial names of molecules yet, but these 10 compounds are so important you must be able to remember them. So, try to learn them now. Trivial names like this are often long-lasting, well-understood historical names that are less likely to be confused than their systematic counterparts. Acetaldehyde is easier to distinguish from ethanol than its systematic name, ethanol is. Trivial names also extend to fragments of structures containing functional groups. Acetone, acetaldehyde, ethyl acetate, and acetic acid all contain the acetyl group abbreviated as AC, and chemists often use this organic element symbol in writing acyl-OH for acetic acid or ethyloacyl for ethyl acetate. Chemists also use special names for the following four fragments because they have mechanistic as well as structural significance. These fragments are vinyl, allyl, phenyl, and benzyl. Giving the vinyl group a name allows chemists to use simple trivial names for compounds like vinyl chloride, the material that polymerizes to give PVC polyvinyl chloride. The significance of the different names for these fragments lies primarily in the variation of reactivity between the vinyl and allyl groups. The allyl group derives its name from garlic, allium sativum because it contributes to the taste and smell of garlic compounds. Allyl and vinyl groups differ in their attachment to carbon atoms. The vinyl group is directly attached to a double-bonded carbon atom, whereas the allyl group is attached to a carbon atom adjacent to the double bond. This distinction is chemically crucial. Allyl compounds tend to be highly reactive, while vinyl compounds are relatively unreactive. For some reason, the allyl and vinyl groups have never acquired organic element symbols, but the benzyl group has, and it is BN. It is again important not to confuse the benzyl group with the phenyl group. The phenyl group is joined through a carbon atom in the ring, while the benzyl group is joined through a carbon atom attached to the ring. Phenyl compounds are typically unreactive, but benzyl compounds are often reactive. Phenyl is like vinyl, and benzyl is like allyl. We will review all the organic element symbols you have met at the end of the lecture. Complicated molecules that have been isolated from natural sources are always given trivial names because, in these cases, the systematic names are often impossible to use. Strychnine is a famous poison featured in many detective stories and has a beautiful structure. All chemists refer to it as strychnine because the systematic name is virtually unpronounceable. Additionally, two groups of experts at IUPAC and Chemical Abstracts have different ideas about the systematic name for strychnine. Other examples of molecules like this include penicillin, DNA, and folic acid. But the champion is vitamin B12, a complicated cobalt complex with a three-dimensional structure of great intricacy. No chemist would memorize this structure but rather consult an advanced textbook of organic chemistry. You will find it in such books listed under vitamin B12 in the index, not under its systematic name. I am not even sure what its systematic name might be, and I am not very interested. Even fairly simple but important molecules, such as amino acids, which have systematic names that are relatively easy to understand, are typically referred to by their trivial names. With a bit of practice, these trivial names are easy to remember and hard to confuse. 
A very flexible way of obtaining new, simple names for compounds can involve combining aspects of systematic nomenclature with trivial nomenclature. Alanine, for instance, is a simple amino acid found in proteins. By adding a phenyl group, you obtain phenylalanine, a more complex amino acid also present in proteins. Similarly, toluene, known as methylbenzene, can be combined, both chemically and in naming compounds, with three nitro groups to form the well-known explosive trinitrotoluene, or TNT. Some compounds are referred to by acronyms, which are shortened versions of either their systematic or trivial names. You just saw TNT as an abbreviation for trinitrotoluene, but the more common use for acronyms is to define solvents and reagents that are in use all the time. Later in the course, you will encounter these solvents. The names and structures of these common solvents also need to be learned. The following reagents are usually referred to by acronym and their functions will be introduced in other modules, so you do not need to learn them now. You may notice that some acronyms refer to trivial and some to systematic names. You may be surprised to hear that practicing organic chemists use systematic names at all in view of what I have just described, but they do. Systematic names really begin with derivatives of pentane since the prefix pent means five. Chemists refer to simple derivatives of open chain and cyclic compounds with five to about 20 carbon atoms by their systematic names, providing that there is no common name in use. Here are some examples. These names contain a syllable that tells you the framework size. Penta for C5, Octa for C8, Nona for C9, Undeca for C11, and Dodeca for C12. These names are easily worked out from the structures, and what is more important, you get a clear idea of the structure from the name. One of them might make you stop and think a bit, but the others are clear even when heard without a diagram to look at. When chemists synthesize complex new compounds in the laboratory, they publish the method for making them in a chemical journal, providing their full systematic names in the experimental account, no matter how long and clumsy those names may be. However, in the text of the paper and during discussions in the laboratory about the compounds they have made, they often refer to them simply as the amine or the alkene or anything else. Everyone knows which amine or alkene is meant because, at some point, they remember seeing a chemical structure of the compound. This is the most effective strategy for discussing almost any molecule. First, draw its structure, then assign it a tag name like the amine or the acid. In written chemistry, it is often easiest to assign a tag number to every chemical structure as well. To illustrate this concept, let's discuss a recent drug synthesis. This potential anti-obesity drug, designated as compound number one, which might overcome insulin resistance in diabetics, was recently synthesized at Abbott Laboratories from a simpler intermediate denoted as 4. In the published work, the drug is referred to as a selective DGAT1 inhibitor, but that designation may not be immediately meaningful to us. In the text of the paper, they commonly refer to it by its compound number 1, which is much more sensible than using its systematic name, as shown below. The simpler intermediate is typically referred to as the keto acid 4, the aryl bromide 4, or the free acid 4, depending on the aspect of its structure they wish to emphasize. Notably, in both cases, a clear diagram of the structure is provided alongside its corresponding number. So, how should you name a compound? It really depends on the circumstances, but you won't go far wrong if you follow the recommendations provided here. We shall use the names for compounds that real chemists use. There is no need to learn all the commonly used names for compounds now, but you should commit them to memory as you come across them. Never allow yourself to pass a compound name by, unless you are sure you know which chemical structure it refers to. In this module, we have encountered many molecules. Most of them were presented to illustrate points, so there is no need to memorize their structures. Instead, Focus on recognizing the names of the functional groups they contain. However, I did recommend learning the names of 10 simple compounds and three common solvents presented here. For practice, cover up the right-hand part of each column and attempt to draw the structures for these 14 compounds. That is all I will say about nomenclature. 
You will find that as you practice using these names and hear other people referring to compounds by name, you will soon pick up the most important ones. But to reiterate, ensure you never pass a compound name without being absolutely sure what it refers to. Always try to draw a structure to check. Thank you for your attention and contribution, and I wish you all the best for the rest of the course.